thanks a lot. Hello, everybody. So before I start, uh, let me say that for me it's 1 a.m. Uh, because I, I come from Paris, and uh, if I feel asleep, don't hesitate to, to wake me up. Just took the plane this morning. Um, okay, let's start. So, as John said, I'm working on Groovy. I'm the Groovy project manager and the spec lead of uh, JSR 241, which is the, the JSR, which is uh, standardizing the Groovy language. I've also We've got Ruby C. I, I, it can also be interpreted at runtime. Uh, for instance, if you want to store some business rules in the database or something like that, you can uh, load and compile on the fly Groovy scripts. And um, if there were, uh, if there was an equation you should try to remember at the end of this talk is that Groovy is the result of uh, an addition of three things. It's an expressive language with a Java-like syntax with new features uh, derived from Java. And it has got some powerful libraries and it has, it has got some MITAC programming facilities and, we'll, and it's what makes uh, Groovy a dynamic language. So speaking of uh, the syntax before showing an example, first of all, as it is Java-like, uh, the learning curve is rather flat compared to other languages which are totally different. Uh, we share the same object-oriented model and libraries as Java, so you don't have to learn new libraries. So there's no impedance mismatch, same object model, almost the same syntax, you can reuse everything you already know all the libraries you've written already. And it adds a few additional uh, syntax sugar, like property support. Uh, you can use strong and weak typing. It's up to you. And uh, we've got things like uh, native syntax for lists, maps, regular expressions. And you can do operator overloading. We've got G-strings, that's certainly the, the sexiest feature of the language. I'm not going to show you mine, but, well, I'll show you some sample of code. Uh, you know, it's interpolated strings where uh, there are placeholders and you can replace uh, parts of the string with variables from uh, the context. And we've got closures, those reusable or assignable code blocks that you can see in other languages like Ruby or Smalltalk. So let's see a uh, first example. So it's a small script with a, a class. So here we see a, a speaker class. So it's a, a groovy bean. It looks like a Java bean. Um, but you see two uh, properties, name and age. Uh, you don't see getters and setters because they are auto-generated for you. And uh, it can be, uh, no, it's the next thing. Um, here you can see a G string. So when you call to string, we are going to replace dollar name and dollar age with the, the value of the properties. You also see that I've omitted the written uh, keyword. It's not mandatory if it's the last expression of your method body. And um, so either a property is strongly typed or it can be weakly typed. So you use the def keyword. And here you can see uh, the native syntax for lists. So it's just square brackets and uh, comma separated uh, list of things. And there's also a syntax for maps as well. Here I'm creating a new speaker. And um, although there's no constructor like that, it's a um, trick added by Groovy. In fact, you're calling the default constructor and then we are calling the set name and set age uh, setters automatically. 
So what you see uh, between parentheses is uh, a map literal. So there's the name key, Mickey Mouse uh, value, age key, AT value. What else? Um, closure. The upper variable is a closure. A closure is just a, uh, a block of code um, separated uh, uh, with curly braces. Um, there's an implicit parameter called it, so it's the sole parameter of, that, of this closure. So here I'm going to uh, retrieve the string representation of um, the argument, and I'm going to uppercase it. There's um, the regular expression syntax and the matcher operator. And it's another closure that is passed to the final method. Final is the, the method that is added to collections. So you can find all the items in this collection that map, uh, that correspond to the criteria uh, uh, matching the name. And you can pass n named closure uh, as method argument as well. And you can inline the closure that you pass to a method. Each is going to iterate over all the elements that we have found. I think that's all for this first uh, sample of Groovy code. So it looks like Java, but I've already shown you a few of the tricks, uh, a few of the sugar added by Groovy, like native syntax for list maps, regular expressions, and closures and properties. OK, so there are um, three main use cases uh, for using Groovy. You can use it just like a uh, shell scripting language, like you would use uh, Bash or Python or Ruby. So you can test stuff interactively in a console. Uh, you can even, uh, well, I've written a little module which is uh, quite fun where you are driving uh, office applications from Groovy. You can launch Word, launch uh, uh, Excel, PowerPoint, and so on. So a second use case is, um, well, you can build standalone, standalone applications. You just write a full application in Groovy. So, it's nice for small to mid-sized applications. Usually when application, applications get bigger, you tend to prefer a statically, ty statically typed language. Uh, but it's nice for its uh, pro prototyping capabilities. And the third use case, which is, to my opinion, the most interesting one is when you integrate Groovy uh, in your application, in your Java, in your JE, in a JEE application, uh, there are various ways uh, for integrating Groovy into your, into your application uh, through JSR223, which, is, uh, the, which are the, the, the scripting API added to uh, JDK6. We've got our own proprietary uh, means of integration, and you can integrate Groovy beans as normal Spring beans in your Spring application. You can, use, you can use Groovy uh, to avoid using too much XML by using some programmatic uh, configuration. What else? You can externalize some business rules in the form of Groovy scripts. And um, you can also write domain-specific languages. I'll say a few words about that later. Uh, just to tell you that it's um, a serious project. It's already used in production, and it's been used in production for over two years already. For instance, there's uh, Mutual of Oma, which is a, an insurance company, uh, Fortune 500 in, in the US, uh, who's been using uh, Groovy to write uh, the, the risk uh, computation algorithms uh, for uh, the insurance policies. And they've got like uh, 50,000 lines of Groovy code in their mission-critical application, uh, half being uh, pure business code and half being test code. So it's one of the biggest applications uh, using Groovy. There are other, it's funny because um, a lot of uh, financial institu institutions are using Groovy for externalizing business rules. And um, uh, one of the key uh, features that uh, made them choose Groovy is that uh, when you use uh, 
arithmetics, when you are adding uh, decimals together, we're using big decimals. So we've got uh, exact arithmetics, and it's nice for uh, actuaries, uh, business domain experts who like handling real operations. It's funny. Well, there are many o other use cases, like um, yeah, the French Ministry of Justice, which used um, Groovy just for as a developer tool for creating, uh, using our own template engine for creating um, um, struts views, uh, struts config files, and so on from a UML model. Um, Oracle is using Groovy in its uh, OC4J uh, container for manipulating JMX beans as, as if they were local beans. And many other frameworks are using uh, Groovy, like Spring, the Rife framework, uh, the Service Mix, uh, JBI container, and uh, can web test. Well, and I've omitted many others. So I've only shown you a little example of code, but there are many features, many syntax sugar uh, that I haven't explained so far. Uh, for things like manipulating JDBC APIs, our own template engine. I mentioned uh, JMX beans, um, regular expressions, and the Swing UIs. I'm going to show you a demo with the Swing UI. And there are uh, external modules for dealing with uh, SOAP web services or XML RPC services with a few lines of code. Uh, there's even a small project uh, building a rules engine, engine sorry, uh, JSR 4999 uh, um, compliant rules engine. But now I'm going to speak about another topic, domain-specific languages. Uh, it's interesting because Groovy allows you uh, to write domain-specific languages. Let me show you that. So first of all, a DSL. So what's a DSL? A DSL it's a small language, uh, which doesn't need to be Turing complete, which covers a particular domain of knowledge, of expertise, uh, or covers a particular set of tasks. It can have uh, different forms, textual form, a graphical form. And usually it produces some result, configure objects, or create data structures. And it can be embedded in the host language. Uh, two kinds of DSL, external and internal DSLs, and Groovy is the tool you can use to write internal DSLs so, so that you can write DSLs inside Groovy programs or inside Java programs. So usually you want to create DSLs to have a more expressive language uh, to model uh, the domain of expertise you want to model, to share a common metaphor between the developers and the domain experts. And uh, if you want to have domain experts help with the design of the business code, uh, it's very handy. And for instance, when I was mentioning uh, uh, Mutual of Oma, uh, both domain experts and developers are able to write those insurance uh, risk calculation stuff together. So let's go a bit further. Some examples of DSLs. Uh, SQL or HTML are DSLs, or even regular expressions. It's a kind of DSL. There are notations like uh, EBNF for modeling uh, language syntax, or um, the chess notation, the music notation. And you can write business DSLs, like life insurance policy I mentioned, and other things as well. So why do I speak about DSLs? Uh, because Groovy is a dynamic language. It's got a malleable syntax that you can customize to your needs to create your own derived language. So you can, um, there are various things you can do, like uh, create nested tree structures. Um, since it's a dynamic language, um, the, di the Method dispatch, method dispatch property access happened at runtime, so you can intercept method called property access. And you can even inject new behavior uh, inside your classes. Even on JDK classes, you can add new behavior or change the behavior of JDK classes. And uh, do some wacky stuff like operator overloading and so on. I've written a, a tutorial on that stuff. 
you want to have more detail about the stuff you can do with Groovy, uh, you can look at this URL. So I've got a little, oh yeah, one more example. Um, I mentioned nested tree structures. Um, you know, the builder pattern lets you create uh, tree structures, graph of objects very easily. And uh, at the syntax level, Groovy allows you to configure tree structured data. So for instance, in my example here, I'm build, I'm, oops, sorry. Um, I'm building uh, some markup code here, some HTML. So I've got uh, a root node, HTML, and a head node uh, below the HTML node. Well, you see the structure right on the right. And uh, it's really at the syntax level, you see the nesting of the elements. So title is below head, which is below HTML. So it's a nice way uh, to express tree structures. Uh, we've got different builders. The example you see is a marker builder, but we've got a swing builder, because swing UIs are typically nested. You've got a, a panel with other panels, with buttons inside that panel, and so on. So it's tree structures. And, um, you can build your own, for instance, if you, if you, if you want to model um, map description or 2D or 3D scenes, uh, you can do that with a builder. And the other few tricks I'm going to show you in my demo just after this slide uh, is the fact that you can add properties uh, or methods to things like numbers. You cannot do that in Java. So I can say $35.00 and I can do additions because I'm overloading operators as well. And um, the nice trick also is that you see four days from now plus 10 hours, you can represent time. And um, you can use named arguments uh, for readability, for instance, if you want to say that a monster moves on the x-axis and y-axis from a certain distance. And you're able to write your own control uh, structures, so if you like uh, to write your own if or your own loops and so on, you can do so. Now, a demo. So I'm using GData to access Google Calendar from Groovy. So let me show you the code first. So there's a, yeah, something I didn't mention. We've got uh, plugins for IDs. So there's a nice plugin for um, Eclipse. Um, there's uh, JetBrains recently announced that they are building their own Groovy uh, plugin. So it's a work in progress. It's not yet on par with our uh, Eclipse plugin. So here you see my little GData demo. So you can see well, I've hidden my uh, password and ID. Um, here is the URL of the feed of my calendar. And I'm using some new methods I've added to things like numbers. So I'm using a, a category. I'm adding methods through a category system. And it will allow me to write things like that. So I can, uh, well, I'm retrieving the service, the calendar service. I'm passing my own credentials with my ID, my password. Um, then um, I, uh, I'm looking for uh, the events uh, spanning two years, one year ago and one year uh, ahead of time. And I'm going to print all uh, the items which are on my calendar. And after that, I'm going to create um, a new event in my calendar. So I'm going to show you that. So Groovy on the common line, gdata, uh, okay, gdata.groovy. I'm going to launch my little script. Oh, it takes a little time. So past here and next year events. Yeah, so interview, my birthday, my wedding, <laughs> and uh, the Java One conference. And we've added a new event to our calendar. So let me show you that. 
it's not that window. Okay, so yeah, just uh, just for the record, uh, the hybr the um, JBoss guys just blogged about uh, their support of Groovy in JBoss Sim, so it's brand new. <laughs> I'm going to show you. So here is my calendar. I'm going to refresh it, and you should see uh, somewhere. Uh, where is it? Yeah, this is uh, the event I've just created with my script. So this is some test, some some content, some test content I, I've just added. So you see now, in a few lines of code, it's quite easy to create uh, new events and deal with your own calendar with a small DSL handling date and time. Okay. Uh, my slides. Yep. Yeah. What's that calendar service? Do you create that? Did you create that separately, or is that automatically created? So here, the calendar service is uh, the class which is uh, f from the jar from GData. It's not something we've created ourselves. So, so who provides that? You. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> So the only thing I've pro I provided here is the small DSL with date and time handling. And um, we've also added a few uh, new methods on the calendar service. For instance, this getFeed method doesn't exist on the calendar service. It's a new method I've added through the GData category. So I can add new things without extending your own classes. I can add new methods, new properties, and so on. So I've added this getFeed method, which, oops, sorry, <laughs> Google mail notifier, uh, which uh, retrieves um, the events. Uh, because the, this stuff, one year ago, is a special class I've created. So it's a time, a duration uh, class I've created. So I created a new getFeed method that is able to handle of those objects I've created. Yep. Yep. Yeah, in that block. And uh, even in that thread. So it's just on that thread. Yep. So if you use the calendar service elsewhere, uh, you will not benefit from this added method if you don't use use. Yeah, it's, well, it's lexically scoped here, but it's also scoped at the thread level. Double scope. So, uh, no, it's not this one. Okay, so first demo. So it was really just a very small example of DSL. You can even build bigger DSL, it's a, just a small example. So you saw the code, I've highlighted the important bits. So another, um, well, Groovy 1.0 uh, was released um, in January. So it's five months old, but we're working on 1.1. And last week we released 1.1 beta 1 which adds a major feature to uh, the language uh, with annotations and, well, other things like static imports as well. So, as of now, uh, Groovy is the sole alternative language uh, for the JVM that supports annotations. No other languages uh, support annotations, apart from Java, of course. So, Groovy 1.1 is currently in development. Uh, yeah, I mentioned that we've just added annotation support. Um, at the moment, it's just uh, annotation usage. You cannot define your own annotations uh, in Groovy, but it will come uh, in the final release on 1.1. So with annotations, you can leverage uh, frameworks and tools like Joyce, TestNG. You can write your own EJB3 JPA annotated beans with Groovy. 
uh, your spring beans using uh, spring annotations like at transactional, things like that. And uh, yeah, I mentioned JBoss Sim. Just let me show you this blog entry here. Uh, yeah, Emmanuel Bernard from uh, JBoss just blogged today about the fact that you can use Groovy uh, to write JBoss Sim applications. So here, what you see is just uh, a Groovy uh, beam. <laughs> And uh, you can see that you don't have those ugly getters and setters. You just use properties and you add um, annotations. It's really nice. So it's brand new out of the oven. And uh, yeah, I already mentioned that we're the sole alternative language uh, providing support for annotations. So now I'm going to demo uh, the usage of annotations. So I've got, um, where is it? Uh, I've got a demo showing um, TestNG and Google Joyce. Um, so um, let's say, so I showed you uh, the Eclipse plugin. Now I can show you uh, the Groovy plugin, uh, the, sorry, the IntelliJ IDA plugin. Uh, what I didn't uh, show you in the, in, in, in the plugin is that you've got, um, Cut completion if it if it wants to work. No, okay. It usually works. Never mind. <laughs> it's a work in progress anyway. So here um, I'm creating a, a simple interface, a calculator to add two things, two numbers or whatever. I'm going to uh, implement. Uh, my calculator, I'm going to provide a, a concrete implementation. It's going to be a, a singleton, so I'm using the, the Joyce uh, at singleton annotation. And I'm going to create a client um, that's, uh, with, a, with a calculator that is injected by Joyce, and I'll execute some calculation by calling the calculator. Okay? And for testing that, I'm going to use TestNG. So I'm going to uh, configure uh, the injector. So I'm using the create injector method. Um, I'm creating a, a new module. And uh, here you can see a, a configure. Well, it's a, it's a trick for creating um, an, some kind of anonymous in our classes. Groovy doesn't support anonymous in our classes, but uh, you can uh, use uh, those maps that you can coerce to an interface. So this is a map with the configure key and a closure. This is a closure. And we transform that map that you see here into something else. It's a module. It's an interface. And then I'm going to uh, retrieve my client. And then I'm creating a simple test method which, going, which is going to assert uh, that uh, um, the result of uh, my calculation is correct. I'm going to launch that from the shell. Uh, so we've got a special um, integration with Groovy and TestNG written by uh, Alexandru Popescu, which is a, a, committer, a, a committer on both TestNG and uh, Groovy. So that's why I've got a special Groovy ng command. Uh, how is it called? Test and joys. Oh, I'm launching it. So it's going to pass my script. And I've got the, the, the result here. One test was run, no failure, no skipped tests. And uh, I think it also generates some tests. So here, uh, you'll see the HTML output generated by test ng. OK. So well, that was the second demo. The code I've just shown you, so the, the part which is uh, leveraging uh, Joyce, the way I'm configuring uh, Joyce, how I bind uh, the, the interface with the concrete implementation, and how I use the at before class annotation to say that before the tests are run, I want to execute that method, and the test method just below. What else? I'm going to show you some other um, demos. 
um, on how to uh, mix Groovy and Google services or APIs. So we've seen how uh, I used uh, GData API with my small date and time DSL. And, um, and so I'm going to show you a few other things. So you guys are offering some really nice APIs and tools like Google Maps, the geocoding service, the GData API for Google Calendar and other services as well. And there's also Google Talk. I'm going to show you a demo with Google Talk. And how can you reuse, and can, how can you mix and match Groovy and all those services? And what Groovy can do for you? Let's see that. So first of all, a little uh, swing mashup where I'm going to use Google Maps, uh, the Google geocoding service, and um, well, I'm going to use Flickr, uh, sorry, <laughs> even, if, even if it's not uh, Google stuff. Uh, here is my mashup class, my little script. So, well, I shouldn't show my Google and Flickr key, so I'm hiding that. I'm using the Swing X um, Swing components, uh, which are some nice components, uh, some open source components, uh, which uh, let you reuse uh, Google Maps from Swing interfaces. And uh, there's a special tile factory, uh, which is calling um, a special URL that will be forged to uh, retrieve the tiles of, um, of the maps. And uh, well, the best is, I'm going to show you the example, Groovy Masha. And you will, you will understand what it does. Okay, so it's loading. Okay, so in the main part of the screen, you see the Google map of Paris, my town, I'm coming from Paris. And uh, on the left, I'm going to show uh, the some, some Flickr photos associated with the address I'm going to type here. So for instance, if I want to go to San Francisco, Okay, I'm going to recenter uh, the map on San Francisco, and of course, can zoom in and out. Okay, I'm going to be at uh, the Moscone Center uh, for the rest of the week for Java One. Uh, what else? I could show you the Statue of Liberty, for instance. Perhaps you'll see some nice pictures as well. Yeah, Liberty Island, and. Oh, we don't see the Statue of the Liberty, but it's some New York pictures. Okay, so there are different things happening here. The Google map, the geocoding service is being called because uh, I want to retrieve the coordinates so that I can update the map with the coordinates uh, associated with this address. And then um, also using the REST service from uh, Flickr to retrieve some pictures. And how is it done? Back to the code. So first of all, I'm, in, I'm uh, instantiating the tile factory, which is uh, the class responsible for finding the tiles of the map. I'm centering uh, the position on Paris, as a starting position. Then I'm going to use the swing builder. So the swing builder is this. Uh, nice stuff for um, creating tree structures. And you can see that I'm creating a frame. Inside that frame, you see a panel. Inside that panel, you see another panel. You see some constraints, some layouts. And inside that panel, you've got a text field. What else? You've got another widget, which is the map viewer. You've got all the panels. So the structure of your swing UI is visible from the code, which is quite nice. And uh, uh, there are three interesting aspects here. And then at the end of the script, I'm packing uh, the window and uh, make it show up. So there are th 
three parts which are interesting. Here, first of all, uh, in this part that I'm going to highlight, uh, I'm calling the geocoding service. So I'm calling the URL of the geocoding service here. Then I'm using, we've got some, some, speci some special XML parsers in Groovy. Uh, so I'm retrieving the text from the URL. I'm parsing that stuff, and it creates a, a node, a, a structure, a dome, a dome structure. And then it's interesting because you can navigate in your DOM model very easily from Groovy because it's just like accessing properties. So on the node, I'm accessing a, chi a child node called response, another status node, which is a child of response, and the code node, which is a child of status. In a single line, you've got a next path-like uh, way of expressing your way inside an XML document. And I'm checking, checking that the, the status code is okay. And if that's the case, um, I'm going to uh, center, uh, uh, I, I'm uh, also extracting the coordinates uh, from the XML feed. And then I'm centering the map here. And if the address is not correct, for instance, if I'm uh, writing some random stuff, I'm going to have a little message tell, telling me that the address is wrong. And that's the message you show here. Then, uh, so when I choose, when I uh, set a new address, I'm going to call uh, uh, this service to uh, recenter the map. I'm also calling Flickr almost the same way. I'm calling the REST uh, URL. I'm passing the XML, and I'm retrieving the photos I'm interested in. So I'm just retrieving a few photos, not all photos returned. Then I'm creating um, the, the URL of uh, the pictures, and I'm setting, uh, you saw the, the buttons on, on the left, and I'm changing the buttons so that they show uh, the new picture. So again, there's this nice syntax for accessing um, the elements of um, the XML feed. And one last thing, perhaps. Um, yeah, that's um, the part which is um, uh, creating um, the, um, the left buttons. So that's it. You see how uh, we managed to uh, mash up different APIs. It's nice for prototyping if you want to try some new um, new stuff and access very easily some, some XML services. Uh, in a few lines of code, you can do that in Groovy. I'm going to close this. So yeah, the, the code I showed, I just showed uh, a, minute, a few minutes ago, so the URL of the map tiles, the way I'm retrieving, um, I'm, I'm using the, the geocoding service, how I can access the XML nodes, and the same, for, the, the same stuff for Flickr. Now another little demo. So um, I'm going to use uh, Google Talk this time. Um, you know that Google Talk is based on uh, the Jabber um, protocol. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just some XML payload which is exchanged uh, between the clients and the servers. And there's a nice library in Java, uh, which is the Smack library that you can use to access um, Google Talk or other Jabber servers. And, uh, Groovy has got a special XML RPC module. Um, and I'm going to use the Groovy XML RPC support to uh, create a client-server system um, which lets you uh, invoke services remotely through, through Google Talk. So let's see the code uh, is here. So I've got a client. And I've got a server. So first of all, I'm going to start. OK, I'm going to start the server here. G 
Sheeto server. And in the other window, I'm going to launch the client. So the, the, the server, well, it's just a simple, a stupid service, which is the echo service. So it will echo whatever it receives, whether it's a number, a string, or whatever it's going to echo it. And um, you can see the use of uh, the smart library. So I'm going to connect to Google Talk. Um, I'm connecting here, I'm logging there, and I'm starting the server. And uh, the nice stuff, in fact, is here. Here, well, I'm creating my own server, which is going to use um, Google Talk uh, as the medium, the transport medium. And here, it's, uh, I'm defining a closure, which is going to be the service which is exposed and executed remotely. And on the client side, well, it's almost the same code for the, the connection parts. Now I'm going to uh, create a proxy around uh, the service, which you see called here. So I'm calling the echo method on the service proxy, which will, in fact, call the remote method. So I'm going to uh, ask the server to echo hello world and this number, okay? So uh, the server is started here, and well, it's not a very uh, impressive demo. You're going to see some uh, message messages written in the console. It's very simple. Okay, I'm going to I'm sending hello world and 3:45, and on the server side, it's being called, and you see uh, the arguments of uh, the remote method. So. It's a basic service. You can do uh, certainly. I'm sure you'll come up with some more interesting ideas. But it's fun to know that you're able to use Google Talk uh, as a client server system in a few lines of code. And the, and the nice bit is really that part, uh, the way uh, you are defining um, the closure defining the remote method, the method that is exposed through Google Talk. And then the client part, which is there. So I used two different accounts, my G LaForge uh, main account and my other, I've got two accounts. I used uh, one for the client, one, one for the server. And that's it. So, the summary, um, what's interesting with Groovy um, compared to other languages on the JVM is that there's no impedance mismatch. So it's really, since it shares the same object-oriented model, the same syntax, a, de a derived syntax, and you can reuse all the Java libraries that, that you have written yourself or, or the, 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 the JDK, or other frameworks and tools. And also the fact that it's using, when you're using a string, it's just a, a Java string. When you're using regular expressions, it's the Java util regex stuff. It's not a new or different regular expression syntax, like it would be the case with other languages. So it's nice to see that it's easy to learn, and you can leverage all the stuff that you've worked on and that you already know. And um, as I said already, it's also the first alternative language that supports annotations. So welcome to EJB3s, JPA, annotated bins, Google Joys, TestNG, and so on, all those frameworks that leverage uh, annotations. And uh, with my small demos, I showed in a few lines of code how you can integrate Groovy with Google Maps, geocoding service, Google Talk, Google Juice, TestNG, uh, and so on. So going further, well, we need you. <laughs> if you want to play with Groovy and, uh, well, just have fun. It's a first, uh, first start, a first step. You can report bugs, provide patches if you want. You can integrate Groovy in your apps. It should be fun, and you can also help us improve our IDE plugins. It's uh, one of the areas where we are focusing on at the moment. So 
uh, it's very important for us to have uh, really good uh, tooling support, IDE support. So it's a work in progress, but we are. Um, so there's the Eclipse IDE plugin, uh, which is worked on by uh, four active committers. Uh, Sun also um, is working on uh, reinvigorating. Um, they had a, an embryonic NetBeans plugin. They are, there's a team dedicated to um, bring it, bring it uh, back, to, back to life. And uh, as I said, JetBrains uh, announced recently that they, they, st they started working on the plugin. And uh, during the demos here, what you see, the syntax highlighting and so on, that's um, the groovy plugin they are working on. So you can see things like code folding or navigation and, and so on. They are working hard on that. What else? Um, in October, there's a dedicated conference um, dedicated to Groovy and Grails with, with different tracks on the Groovy language, on the Grails web framework. I didn't mention the, the Grails web framework. It's a web framework based on Groovy, Spring, and Hibernate, and other libraries like uh, uh, Quartz, SiteMesh for uh, decorating pages, and a few Ajax uh, APIs like uh, Dojo and so on. And uh, there are some uh, famous speakers from Interface 21 or Google, JBoss, and Sun coming to this conference. So it's in October and it, it's in London. So if you want to uh, cross uh, on the other side of the pond, uh, you can come and see us. And uh, additionally, um, yeah, North Love Just Stuff is running, um, you know, this uh, North American tour uh, with uh, conferences all around the USA every two weeks or something like that. And they've, and they've got a dedicated Groovy and Grails track. So if you want to know a bit more about Groovy and Grails, uh, you can go there. Some further reading. So I've co-authored Groovy in Action. And there's a nice book on Grails as well. And uh, here are a few URLs. Um, my blog, uh, the, the URL of the Groovy website, there's a dedicated uh, news site called aboutgroovy.com, uh, my domain-specific language tutorial. There's uh, a Java blog like aggregator uh, just for Groovy. So you'll see Groovy and great stuff just on this aggregator. And well, I think that's all. If you've got some, first of all, thanks a lot for your attention. And if you've got some questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Yep. Two related questions. Um, you talk about performance at all, so how much um, overhead do you have to expect? Yeah. Yeah, right. So first, the, perform the performance aspect. Uh, since it's a dynamic language, um, that uh, what we call the meta object protocol, which is this stuff that is running um, the method dispatch and property access, uh, because of this, of Groovy being a dynamic language, we've got, of course, an overhead compared with raw Java code. So we have to handle uh, the logic behind uh, choosing the right method and so on. So Groovy will always be a bit slower than Java. So I don't have exact figures. It can vary uh, from, well, the, the, the last figures I've heard were like, it can be 20 percent the performance from Java to 80 percent. Uh, so it's a bit slower. It can be up to four or five times slower in certain cases, or it can be almost as fast as Java in other cases. It depends. So that's the first aspect. And uh, the other question was about, yeah, the, um, yeah how, um, so as uh, we've got a runtime system uh, which is um, handling the way method, methods are called, 
Um, in fact, when you are in your code, when you're doing foo.bar, uh, parenthesis, when you're calling the bar method on foo, before doing the actual call, we're going through some uh, custom classes uh, to make the actual dispatch. And that's how you can plug into this runtime system to intercept method calls. So you can even create an existing method. You can drop method calls to methods that don't actually exist. So that's the kind of things you see happening in, uh, you, you, you know, in my little DSL example where uh, you can do one dot har dot ago. Well, one is just an integer. So how the hell am I going to intercept this property on an integer? Well, I'm using this runtime system. I've got, um, you know, in Java there's the class concept. So with a certain, well, an object has got a class which defines uh, the behavior uh, at compile time of all the instances of this class. And in Groovy, the runtime system is, uh, has got a special class which is called the meta class, which defines um, the runtime behavior of your class. So each class has got uh, its own meta class, a default meta class, but you can customize that to uh, trap method calls and add new stuff yourself. That's how it's working. When you compile code, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, yeah. And so following up on that, will uh, would adding invoke dynamic uh, to the JVM help, or would you still essentially have to go through the same indirection that you have to go through now? So um, invoke dynamic uh, is not progressing much uh, lately, so it's hard to know whether we're going to be able to leverage this new uh, bytecode instruction. But hopefully, well, we've got uh, the, the core, the, the core committer, the, the main uh, developer on Groovy, uh, who is a full-time uh, developer on the project, uh, is part of the, um, the, expert group, the expert group of this JSR. So I hope it's going to uh, provide some directions uh, to this JSR so that we can leverage this stuff for ourselves, so that it helps us. Uh, improved performance, and so on. No other questions? So thanks again. Thank you very much.